What is behind my faith? Love. To me, the path of Christ is a complete example of love. And I can't think of a better way to move throughout the day. I can't think of a better way to be grateful. I can't think of a better way to um, encounter others, to encounter myself. Um, yeah, the embodiment of love. It was the 70s. Encounter with God. I hope I'm making you proud. I had a good one. I just had a conversation with God, and he came in and he ate with me. How did I imagine my life? Um, I think like most children, I imagined I'd be rich and famous. <laughs> I remember being a kid in my grandmother's house and I would make fake checks to myself and I would write large sums of money to myself and I would sign them. I would practice my signature and I would practice writing millions of dollars of checks. I, I haven't thought about it. In, in years, but it's funny. Um, I had no idea I would be an actress. I had no idea I would really do this. I thought I was gonna be Misty Copeland before Misty Copeland. I was a dance student and I was very passionate about dance, but I loved stories and I loved storytelling, but I was very, very shy. I was very shy and very uncomfortable. I mean, I kind of am now. I've just gotten used to being an introvert who people stare at sometimes. <laughs> so I'm attending a private school now in Manhattan called Professional Children's School. Basically, the school is set up to accommodate working actors, working kids working in the business, right? So I was there because, again, my dance schedule was quite intensive. At this point, I'm an Alvin Ailey scholarship student, and I'm on the track to basically become, become move into the ju junior company and all that stuff. So because we had a lot of actors who also attended the school, occasionally casting notices would come directly from casting directors to our school. And one day there's a notice on the bulletin board and the description is 14 to 16 year old, diverse pep squad girl to be on the Cosby show. And at that point, it was the second season of the Cosby show we were all watching. I mean, America was watching The Cosby Show, period. And I thought, oh, I want to be on The Cosby Show. <laughs> I fit this description. Um, and I had done some, again, school plays, but nothing professional. I didn't have an agent. I called uh, the Hughes Moss Agency and I explained to them where I saw the notice and that I was a student at PCS and they set up an appointment time for me to come in and read. I went in, Barry Moss read with me. I had no clue what to do. He explained the whole process, gave me sides, told me what to do. We read and he was like, that was pretty good. Let's try it again. He gave me some notes, did it again. And then he had me come back. And ultimately I ended up being cast. So my very first <laughs> professional audition, I ended up as a guest star on the number one show in America. That was the beginning. That was the beginning. And it was Mr. Cosby who picked me to be on the show. And a lot of people have asked me, you know, in light of what's happened with him and the career and the allegations and him being convicted, you know, did I know, see, experience anything? And I say, no, I had an incredible experience there. I felt in very safe um, and respected and adored and looked after by him and everyone around um, on that set. Like I was a very ballsy kid. As much as I was an introvert and shy, I had a, when it came to, if I wanted something, I was real. I don't know where that came from, but I was determined to get it. We all have these dichotomies in us, right? We all have this duplicity in us, you know, and that's the beauty and the tragedy of, of humanity. And that's, so much where grace comes in is you realize like we're all capable of everything, everything amazing and everything tragic and terrible, right?
My parents met in a disco. They were never married. It was the 70s. <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't know that... It, I think my mother intended to have a baby and I think that was news to my dad. Like, I, it was not, it was not traditional. I don't come from a traditional home, household. I think I gravitated towards stories in search of tradition, in search of what you see on television and movies. Um, there was definitely, which is probably again, the need for escapism um, in terms of eventually becoming a storyteller. I definitely looked for some sort of Norman Rockwell-ish thing that didn't exist and that, you know, so now thinking about it, it made sense that I would want to be on The Cosby Show. It made sense that it would be enough of a draw to make me overcome my fear and, and my self-consciousness to try. That makes sense. I hadn't thought about it, but now, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It was a perfect family. My grandmother introduced me to spirituality. My grandmother, uh, my dad's mom, Blanny Talaferro from Mississippi. Uh, she was a churchgoer. She went to church every Sunday. Um, and whenever I was with her, I went to church every Sunday. And my mom, I lived with my mom, but my mom went through a whole, she was raised Roman Catholic. And then when I was a young like my earliest memory, she was a practicing Muslim. And then, yeah, so I would kneel and pray and have my head covered. Like it was, and then she left that phase. And then at one point she practiced Buddhism, you know, so nam myoho renge kyo, I know that. <laughs> like she just went through a lot of different searching. And now what's funny is she's back to Roman Catholicism. She's, yeah, she goes to mass every, every week. It's weird. I never doubted God's existence. Didn't have a relationship with God, but I never doubted that there was one. And really like when I made the conscious decision to become a Christian, I want to say I was 23. I was 23. I was working on a show called Under One Roof in Seattle, Washington, and we were shooting the pilot. And I remember very particularly and specifically having an encounter, a very real encounter with God. And it was um, undeniable. And after that, my life never looked the same. I was home alone in my apartment, my rental apartment. And I started hearing God. God was speaking to me. I heard Jesus talking to me and it wasn't like out loud, but it was a voice that was not my own. And the words were not my own. And I remember thinking, am I crazy? Like, what is happening right now? And I went into the kitchen and I made dinner and the voice was like, set a place for me. And so I set the table for two and I cooked and I, I didn't serve food on the second plate, but I prepared a second space. And I remember opening the door and like sitting down at the table and speaking out loud to the voice that was asking me questions and having a conversation. And later that night, whoop, later that night, I remember randomly opening the Bible and I went, it took me to Revelations 3.20. And I read, yea, though I'd stand at the door and knock. And I was like, you know, I'm from New York. I was like, yo, this just happened. Like I just had a conversation with God and he came in and he ate with me. He didn't eat, but he ate with me. And I heard his voice and I talked to him and I saw that scripture after. And that's the first scripture that I ever memorized. And I was like, this is so, like, it was undeniable. I'm like, whoa, I had no idea that Christ and the relationship is personal. It's not it's not somewhere up there. It's personal. It's in the lion's den with you. You know, it is in the fire. It's not like 
oh, I'm up here and I'm just hovering and I'm just bestowing. And it's like, it's not fairy dust. God is with you. He's right there with you through it all, every second of every moment of every day, through everything. And there's no mistake that you can't recover from. And there's no sin that makes him love you less. And that was just an astounding, practical moment for me. Because again, I didn't know. Well, it's funny, my son, he is such a sweet, thoughtful, empathetic spirit. And I say that because I noticed it. He wasn't yet to. And his father and I had gone to Kansas where he went to school to his alma mater for a ceremony. And we brought him with us. And when we were coming back, we're at LAX. Um, we're at the conveyor belt waiting for our luggage. My son was um, 22 months, maybe 21 months. And a man walked by and he, you know, just a stranger walked by and he sneezed. And my son went, are you okay? And the man kind of looked around like, where's this voice coming from? And he saw my son and he said, yes, I'm fine. He's like, okay. And I thought to myself, I got a good one. I got a good one that he had the wherewithal and the impulse to check on a stranger, to hear the duress or hear the signal and, and check on him. And I was like, yeah, I got a special soul. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. There's actually a video on my Instagram. Uh, every week in his school, he has to memorize a Bible verse. I help him memorize it is like rhythmically, musically. So if you watch the video, you, it says, be strong and courageous. He will never leave you and never forsake you. And what is that? Deuteronomy 31 He's very aware of the power of prayer and, and very um, eager to seek God, which is, again, like, I don't, I don't take credit for that, but I'm, it's, um, it's astounding for me. It's astounding that he gets it so young. He actually asked to be baptized recently. Yeah, so... Hasn't, we haven't done it yet, but he said he wants to. Motherhood has made me better in so many ways. Um, it's definitely made me more patient. Um, it's made me a lot more vulnerable in terms of um, understanding that I need help and guidance and wisdom um, from the village around me that I trust, but most of all from God. Like I really, there are questions and considerations and moments where I really have to pray through them and just literally I'm like, Lord, please don't let me screw him up in how I answer this and how I teach him this and how we talk about this. I'm still explaining divorce. Um, and it's changed, you know, he was four, he had just turned four when I left and it was very traumatizing for him. He didn't understand. Um, he kept asking me to come home. There were many conversations through tears and pleading and begging. And I, it was really hard to tell him that I couldn't give him what he wanted most over and over and over again. It was really incredibly painful to watch him cry and beg and him to say, but mommy, why? And knowing that I couldn't give him an answer really. Well, why, when are you gonna explain it to me? When I'm six? <laughs> um, yeah, it was awful. I don't understand anybody who can have a divorce party. Mazel if you can. I, I, it's an awful, awful experience. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, I, on, on my worst enemy, which hopefully I don't have any like that. But I, it's an awful thing. And particularly when you have children. And he was so heartbroken. And he still um, 
three and a half years later, would love for us to reconcile and, and get back together. That's still probably the thing he would give up his iPad for. <laughs> um, and it's still painful to tell him that that is not going to happen. Um, but I think you have to be honest. But honesty not to the point of trying to prove anything or be right or change his mind about love. You know, that's the part that I try to be really conscious of is that I don't explain anything to him that compromises. And I think my ex-husband does the same thing that compromises what his view of us is, you know? Um, and some days he can grasp it and some days he still struggles. And I don't try to rush that either. You have to have patience and let them process. Um, I, at least that's what I try to do. And patience for myself as well. Because I still have moments where I can't believe I'm not married. When I got married, I never, if you had asked me, I would have bet every ounce of money I had ever made and would ever make on the fact that I was never getting a divorce. Um, you know, in leaving, God showed up for me in so many ways. And I'm not saying that God sanctioned the divorce, but at every turn, I saw that I would be cared for. And so would my son. And so would my ex-husband. And that gave me the strength that we would be okay. That all of us, if we led in love, if we led in forgiveness, if we led in grace, if we continued to try and make an environment that was best for him while still maintaining our own um, help, health, um, that it was going to be okay. But like, I think it's important to kind of note the remarkable timing of God. You know, I filed for divorce and I was staying with my girlfriend, Valerie Pettiford. Big Dee Dee from Half and Half, for those of you who don't know her real name. Um, I was staying in her guest room on an air mattress at the time with two suitcases. And it was pilot season. And I was auditioning. And I got cast three weeks after I filed to play Marlon's wife, ex-wife, on a comedy about divorce. I mean, you got to think, what are the odds that I was going to be on a show with my favorite leading man, by the way, because we'd worked together at this point. At that point, it had been four times that I'd worked with him. Someone I love, adore, trust, respect, um, just have the best time with, who gives me the freedom to be as creative as I can am capable of being, and there's no fear of judgment or mistake, which is a rare thing in this business anyway. And I'm going to play his ex-wife of their, and, and we're going to be figuring out in a comedic, humorous way, how you continue to love each other without being together and what that looks like between a couple and their friends and their kids. It was such a blessing, such a huge, incredible moment that I'm so grateful for. It was very clear to me when I left, God kept telling me, don't fight over stuff. Don't fight over stuff. Just, I'll restore you. I mean, that's why I wanted to do this interview here. This house um, is a testimony of his restoration. Because when I left my marriage, I left with my clothes. And I took my books, eventually, and my photo albums and my movies. <laughs> 
I have a DVD collection. It's back in that wooden cabinet over there. I was really like Steve Martin and the jerk. I don't need anything. I just need this lamp. <laughs> I, you know, I was just like, I just need my, I just need my Godfather collection and, and, and my, you know, and my, uh, training day movie. I don't, you know, I really, I, I didn't want to fight over stuff. And again, I, I kept hearing the messaging so clearly, like, let it go. I just, just every, everything will be restored. Just trust me. Just trust me. And I just kept seeing that evidence over and over and over again. You guys are in my home. I've been here two months, three months at this point, and it was the most people I've ever had in here. Um, and I would never really probably allow a crew in here unless it was connected to something like this because this space is sacred to me. This is this has to be a safe space. More importantly, yes, for me, but also for my son. Um, so I'm very particular, much more so. I'm very particular. And I, it's a lot easier for me to say no as a mother than it was for me as an individual. I, I can protect my son without apology. And when it's necessary for me to say no and rear up, I can do that when it comes to him much easier than I could for myself. So to be here in this home and to have started fresh and been given so many, such abundance, I'm very, very grateful. And to me, if we're gonna talk about God and restoration and healing and, and trusting, then it felt to me like this home was an absolute demonstration and a testimony of that. If God was here right now, I hope I'm making you proud. And anything that that isn't um, help me change, you know. Um, and I love you, and I'm incredibly honored to be a part of the kingdom. And I'm just uh, astounded that you saw me fit and forgave so much to reconcile me and help me to look at the world around me with the same eyes that you have and see my fellow man in the same way that you do. Yeah. That's what I would say. Sheesh. Sorry.